Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and my guest today is Ralph Gomery, a mathematics PhD from Princeton who taught there, then worked at IBM for 30 years, retiring as its senior vice president for science and technology in 1989, when he went on for some years to be president of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Together with Richard Silla, a colleague at New York University's Stern School of Business, my guest has now written a quite fascinating article in which they point out how from its earliest years, America led the world in making the corporate form of business organization easily available to entrepreneurs with its long life, limited liability, and ever-expanding opportunities for pooling the resources of many investors thus contributing greatly to our incredible economic growth as a nation. But as much of, as our national wealth owes historically to corporate growth, Professors Silla and Gomery point out that there has now been a shift, a shift away from a nation-building stakeholder view of corporate interests and purposes, with workers, suppliers, customers, all of us, as stakeholders, to one dominated by profit and shareholder value maximization, with an I'm all right, Jack, let the devil take the hindmost attitude that I gather sets my guests' teeth on edge. He and his colleagues write, quote, we strongly question whether this shift has been beneficial to the country as a whole. There is a need now to find ways of inducing corporations to act in ways that produce better societal outcomes in which corporate interests and the public interest might become better aligned. And yet I would now ask my friend Ralph Gomery whether that's not just wishful thinking unless by, quote, inducing corporations, he means requiring them to do the right thing. Ralph, question for you. Well, and this is not the first time <coughs> in American history when corporations have sort of veered off a societally desirable path. That, that happened <coughs> in the 1920s and culminated in the Great Depression. And then from the Dep Great Depression came changes in the way we uh, relate to corporations and they relate to us. Okay. By inducing them to change their ways? In that case, uh, yes. Not by regulation, not by requiring changes? Oh, well, it depends what you mean by induce. I mean, there were, you know, we got the 40-hour week, we got uh, retirement, mandatory uh, retirement benefits. We had the corp corporations had to report what they were doing in a way they didn't previously, things of that sort. Those were legislation. But the surrounding... Uh, the surrounding world probably had more impact than anything else because <clears throat> when we came out of the Second World War, within a very few years, our whole system was under challenge from the Soviet system. Okay? And it was a huge challenge. Their economy was growing very rapidly. There were major communist parties in France, in Italy. China went communist. In other words, we were in a struggle 
against a totally different system. And we could not afford, and everyone felt that in their bones, to run a capitalist system here, or a free market system, that only paid uh, off for the rich. Right? So we didn't. We ran a system here for 30 years in which everybody gained. I know everybody is too extreme because it wasn't true for minor certain minority groups. But as far as workers versus owners, it was. The share of the national income that went to the very wealthy was stable. And the share that went to the middle class was stable. Both went up together. They shared the gains of productivity. And in the end, this form defeated the communist threat. But there's one word that you're leaving out. What's that? Globalization. No, there wasn't. Yeah, at that time. Okay, but now yeah. there is. Well, globalization is just one more way that a company whose only purpose is profit uh, can go and find cheap workers. But now they do, and they do yeah. with a vengeance. Yes, but it isn't true that we couldn't uh, change that. Okay, but Ralph, what, I'm, what I come back to, and yeah. you'll forgive me for doing Please. so. Uh, go, go to it. That is that <laughs> I, I think there's a step missing here. I mm -hmm. think you, you, you want to make a plea. I see you, mm -hmm. and I said this before we came into the studio. I've mm -hmm. been reading the things that you've been writing up yeah. to this, this piece on manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find you getting angrier and angrier, and yet you talk about... Uh, inducing um, it, it's it's like a piece that appeared yesterday in the times by andrew ross sorkin expressing what i thought was surprise surprise greed is still lurking in the halls of uh, wall street mm -hmm. how do you induce these people now with globalization to go back well, to the good I, old days. I, I really don't think globalization is the heart of the matter. It's just a manifestation, a way in which corporations, which are dedicated to profit only, make a profit. It happens to be an unusually destructive way. But as long as that's their de dedication, uh, then uh, that's a problem. Uh, How would you change that dedication? Well, I think there are, first of all, uh, through, through government action, if, let's take globalization. Could the government do anything about globalization? Certainly, it could. Right? But it would have to use methods whose very names have become uh, uh, things you don't want to utter, like tariff. Okay? There's a very simple scheme that was proposed by a uh, well-known uh, capitalist, Warren Buffett, uh, which he called... Um, import share and import certificates which would balance trade we it's it's not just globalization we have globalization and we're importing far more than we export okay so the first and that means that, that we're letting in all sorts of low price goods that are destroying our own industries right now when, that is very stoppable when you say destroying our own industries yes. You don't mean destroying corporate America. Because well, not the whole thing. But but isn't no. when you say destroying our industries, you're no. you're sort of saying it seems to me, industries that are not hand in glove involved in the globalization process. No. No. Well, it depends what you mean by destroying an industry, right? Uh, let's let's say we, we used to make something here like cars, yeah. okay. well, we make half the cars now, okay. and, half a, and, and half of the parts are imported. So much of that industry, we still have a name here, okay. but the work is done somewhere else, and the result is imported here. Now that's a very profitable way of doing things. Profitable for whom? It's profitable for that. It shows up as the profits of the company, and therefore it's profitable for the shareholders and for those who are paid uh, a, basically a percentage of the profits rather than wages. And the people we used to consider stakeholders don't count? No. 
in fact, it's to the interest of the shareholders to hold down wages because there's more, more left. You see, corporations create value. That's why they're so important. I think take a stack of parts, which they buy from somebody, and assemble it, I'm simplifying obviously, into a car, which is very valuable. Okay? They add value by these activities. Now that added value which they've created, they can do a lot of things with. One is they could pay wages. Okay? Another is they could have profits and give it to the shareholders. Third is they could pay taxes and support the government. There are a few other things, but those are the big things. Now, in that pie, we have only in recent years taken the point of view the shareholders should get it all. If we can avoid taxes by doing fancy tricks in Ireland, we'll certainly do that. And if we can hold down people's wages, which isn't hard to do when you're in a depression, which is really good stuff, okay, we'll do that. But uh, we could have uh, corporations that are A, prevented from making these profits by uh, balancing trade, or have incentives that their corporate tax rate goes down when they hire people in the U.S., when they have value in the U.S., not in China, for example. As I read the press, yeah. the effective tax rates mm -hmm. of many corporations are so low now mm -hmm. it would be pretty hard to give them a further advantage. In other words, they're doing pretty well at what they're doing now. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. Which is why when you sort of talk about, now fellas, be nice, I'm not that's what I read. Yeah, yeah. It certainly isn't the way I feel about it. Hey fellas, be nice. It's a question of, uh, it's not a, a thing about nice fellas at all. It's a system which produces this result. It isn't bad guys. I'm one of the bad guys. Don't forget that. Tell me what you mean by that. I serve on corporate boards. I vote to move our stuff overseas, right? So it's not about bad guys. Not at all. It's a system which says if you're going to do things other, with any consideration other than profits, we're going to remove you. Where in the world mm -hmm. does this come from except from guys who make the corporate decisions, you and others? You know, if you have, if you be have, patient with me. Well, I, I think your your questions are very good, right? But let me just say, uh, it's a question of what is accepted by society. Between 1945 and 1975, these same corporations, manned by pretty much the same bunch of people, behaved totally differently. And, and there weren't being, uh, there was no magic wand. That was the accepted thing. And now? Now, uh, what, they, what, the, what the stockholders have done, and started to do this in a big way around 1980, and this changed the system completely, is they gave huge stock, own, uh, stock options to the ownership. I mean, to the, excuse me, to the corporate leadership. To the corporate leaders. Yep. Corporate, um, uh, the, uh, the payments to the corporate leadership went up <laughs> fantastically, which was, in my opinion, and this is going to sound perverse, it was a tribute to their basic human nature. Right? They didn't accept the goal of profit only, hold down the wages, doesn't matter what happens to the country, for a 10% raise. You said to their basic human nature, yes. and I interpret that as meaning bad guys, not good guys. I'm sorry, you, you didn't understand what I said. Okay. I said that these guys were normal human beings, right? Okay, and therefore, to turn their backs on everything but profit, you had to offer them a hell of a lot of money, not something small. You had to overcome what are their basic instincts. Why, what, what, when I was there, uh, in, this er in the earlier period, okay, we were not, who, who did you see every day? You saw the people who worked for you, okay? What were you proud of? You were proud when you had a good product and it started to sell, all right? Or you're ahead of your competition. That's daily stuff. That's what you cared about. That's what the people around you cared about. The shareholders, well, their representatives met every three or four months, 
okay? And you fed them dividends and hoped they would go away. And they did then. They had to come up with something new to assert themselves, and they did it very, very well. But they really, uh, the instinctive direction was not that. You had to pay them like mad to change it. What do we do now? Well, I think there, there are a whole bunch of things. I think one is I would advocate uh, 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 and all of the above, okay? I would advocate something like Warren Buffett's scheme, just balancing trade. So one of the great fictions of the moment is that we're, we're negotiating free trade pacts. We're not. We're dealing with countries of which China is the best current example, which subsidize the hell out of uh, its industries. Okay? That's why this stuff is so cheap. It's so cheap that pours in here. It's cheaper than we can make it. It's cheaper than they can make it, too, without subsidies. And an, ex and an artificial exchange rate, right? But they are gradually taking over these industries, okay? Not so gradually. But. And it's very profitable right now for the corporations, and profits matter now in a way they didn't matter before to the corporate leadership because they become immensely rich. Yeah. So, yeah. What do we do with this corporate? Uh, group that has become immensely rich and wants to hold on to its riches and has through its riches mm -hmm. the power to control the um, the process that you want to go through of getting yes. them to now that that's a, now you're making a very good point if we if we can assume that the, the corporations have so much money or and also certain individuals have so much money that uh, they can control congress and state governments then you have to think of something else. Okay? Have you thought of something else? Sure. What? Right. There's no reason why other people cannot start corporations on a different line. Why do, why do banks have to be owned by these, uh, this kind of a bank? We would get better people to work for us because that's human nature to want to do something reasonable. And it had to be overcome by these huge amounts. There's still plenty of people who would, why not run corporations that would attract the best people to work for it and have reasonable goals. By the best people, you mean best in terms of the business of manufacturing? Whatever, the, whatever business they're in, yes, certainly. Yeah. And they would be motivated. I mean, right now, you've got a very motivated uh, top crust in these corporations. The rest of the people are wondering, how the hell can I, you know, how can I make this goal they're setting for me? I'm tired, I want to go home. I think you can beat that. Anybody agree with you, Ralph? Yes. From the real world. Forgive me for saying that. I always cringe when people talk so to me about, about the, the real, real world. world right? I know. I'd like to challenge you, Richard. Right. Which of us has spent more time in the real world? Right? Well, I'm older than you, so I have. You know, here on Earth, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but if you yes. didn't spend 30 years with IBM. No, right. you're right. Right. You were in the business. Right? I was I not, a director I of many companies. I was elected one of America's best directors. And now you start to tell me that I don't understand anything about the real world. That's not what the real world has been telling me. But the real world now is what it is now. And it was a different world 30 years ago. And what would you say made it different? What changed it? I think that um, stock options and the disappearance of the Soviet threat. Those right. two things right. changed it. And there's nothing inevitable about that sort of change. Stock options to the leaders of industry. That's right, just the leadership, yeah, right. Yeah. right. I mean, we all, all, the, all the time when, when we have startups and stuff, they don't take that point of view. Everybody gets a part of it, okay? They don't have, oh yeah, won't you come and work for me 60 hours a week? and I'll give you as little as I can to get you. No, you don't do that with a startup because you want the heart and enthusiasm of those people. That's not limited to uh, small companies. You see, I can't, I can't second guess you or yeah. uh, disagree with you. And when you, you and Richard Siller write this piece and you start off with a quotation yeah. from Theodore Roosevelt, not. Mm -hmm. 
not someone, uh, not a flaming radical, yeah. his first annual message to Congress, 1901, right. great corporations exist only because they are created and safeguarded by our institutions. And it is therefore our right and our duty to see that they work in harmony with those institutions. That's right. And, and Theodore Roosevelt was very much a member of the 1%, right? to use a very Indeed. modern terminology. Okay. Indeed. Yeah. But you know, when I wrote my documentary, History of the United States, the first version of it back in 1950, a yep. long time ago, mm -hmm. I had a chapter in which I wrote about the permanent Roosevelt Revolution. I was talking right. about FDR. Yes. Fifty years later, yeah. uh, I wrote in it, yeah. in its eighth edition, mm -hmm. I was wrong. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a permanent revolution. Yeah. And yeah. do you feel that that's wrong? That, well, not I, not no, wrong morally. No, but I, th I think what you're saying is absolutely right. There's a counter-revolution against yes. that revolution. But no, count this, no, it, the counter-revolution is no more inevitable or inherently permanent than the revolution was. All of these things are, can be worked on. Yeah. And far be it for me to say, no, they can't be worked on, but I must admit, it boggles my mind to even try to think of where you take your first steps when I look, when I read the newspapers, when I read the daily newspapers. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, where is that first step? Who is going to take, who is going to throw the first rock? Mm -hmm. Well, Maybe I mean, there's, there's, a, there's certainly, uh, um, I mean, the Occupy Wall Street showed, you know, a tendency to th rock throwing. But uh, aside, I mean, there, there are two whole avenues of approach. One is through the government. Yeah. And the other is by ha starting companies on a different principle. I wanted to stop you before yeah. and say, where where does the um, where does the capital come from to start these companies? First of all, I mean, there's no uh, there's no reason why. They, I mean, Richard, you have lived on Earth longer than I, but remember the insurance industry. Yeah, I remember it, and I observe it now. Tell all right. me about it. All right. Most of those companies were, quote, mutual companies. They managed to get started. Right? Now, it's true that many mutual companies, in very recently, have been taken over for the benefit of uh, their uh, leadership. So by mutual companies, you're, you're they, saying? They were owned by the, share, by the uh, in, insured. That's what it meant. Mutual of Omaha. Right? Do you think we're going to do that? Do you think th that? Do you see in our society the potential for successfully I would mutualizing that. our problems? I would say that's one of the possibilities. I mean, you, I'm not giving up on the government either, but it looks very bad right at the moment. Right? But look, uh, people don't have to go along with this stuff. And, you know, part of what I struggle to do is get them to wake up to... Uh, th too many of them sound like you, Richard, which is, gee, there's nothing we can do. This is impossible. This is unreal. It's real. It was real. It's real in other countries. Why the hell can't it be real here? No, you're, you're missing a step. What I say, yeah. that's the first question I ask you. Yeah. Weren't you sounding mm -hmm. as though this can be easily done no. when I'm saying, really? You're talking about a revolution of kind. Well, I just don't want to use the word revolution. No, you don't. Because it just means people go out in the street and throw rocks. I mean, you can have a revolution. We had a revolution in the 1980s spurred by stock options. We had a revolution against the orientation of the companies. Right? We could have another revolution by starting companies with a different orientation. It's because people like me commenting on what happened in the Roosevelt years said, yes. it's a permanent revolution, it's changed, when it never did change. And those who were ready to turn around what FDR did were training themselves to do what they're doing now. Richard, how can you ignore the fact that that w itself was a revolution? In the 1920s, we had the same kind of corporate behavior as we have now. And yet, when it got bad enough, 
a, a president, in this case it was through the government, mm -hmm. changed all that stuff, right? To me, that means that it hasn't got bad enough yet. It might be. I don't know what it takes. Mm -hmm. When you think of all the people who are unemployed today and mm -hmm. all the people who are losers yeah. today or losing, mm -hmm. what would it take? I don't know. I just don't know how to predict the unpredictable. To me, of course, one of the things it would take would be reading some of the articles you've been writing mm -hmm. because you are, I think, getting angrier and angrier and you're not going to take it any longer. Well, you may be right, but I'm not the only person writing like that and thinking like that. What does, what is the response to what you've been saying and writing? I get some very good responses, and I get some very, I'm not going to name the names, but some very prominent people who you would think of as the core of the establishment write to me and say, gee, that ought to be better known. And do you think something will happen? You do think something will happen. I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime, which doesn't look as if it'll extend very far from where it is now, but uh, I have no, no reason to believe that the path we're on is uh, revolution-proof or change-proof. We've been on the bad side. Then we had this going on, the FDR revolution. Now we have the counter-revolution. Which we're very and, much and into. Which we're into, right. And there's always the tendency to say, well, whatever we are in now, that's going to go on forever. I don't share that tendency. I don't either, but I'm glad it's in your <laughs> hands to write the kinds of things you've been writing yeah. to take us in another direction. Ralph yeah. Gomery, thank you so much for joining me. And today. thank you for having me here, and it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks, Ralph. Yeah. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to reprise this program online right now or to draw upon our archive of 1,500 or so other open mind and related programs. That's 13.org slash open mind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.